Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Harvard Kennedy School and the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're glad to have all of you with us for tonight's forum um, on race, film, and culture. And tonight's moderator this evening is Brandon Terry. Uh, Brandon is a prize fellow here at the university uh, and is when the, uh, working on economics, history, and politics. And so Brandon will introduce the rest of our panel and serve as tonight's moderator. So please join me welcoming Brandon. So I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming, particularly on the first nice day we've had in a long time, uh, to our panel, Race, Film, and Culture. Uh, what we're going to be dealing with here is one of the most important and incendiary themes uh, in the history of American cinema, uh, much like American culture writ large, and that is race. Um, the film that begins the end of the silent picture era is actually a film about an actor uh, who performs in blackface. This is a film called The Jazz Singer. And the history of race is written in every evolution of American cinema. And, you know, for us to understand our contemporary culture and the way that the historical imagination functions in American society, we need to desperately consider film uh, and consider it seriously. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, the president, uh, screened the famous Ku Klux Klan propaganda film, The Birth of a Nation, at the White House al along the same time as he was resegregating the federal government in DC. And he declared that film history written in lightning. We're at a far remove from that period now. We have an African American in the White House. And the reigning Best Picture winner is a film about a um, free man, a free black man who was kidnapped into slavery. And most of you know it well. 12 years a slave. So we're at a different time, but we want to discuss this complicated and challenging history and the meaning of what might be called the new African American film renaissance. And right now we've got two of the greatest people in the entire country to discuss this. Uh, I couldn't be more excited to introduce Wesley Morris, uh, who is a staff writer at Grantland, where he writes criticism about movies, popular culture, uh, and style in professional sports. He's a former film critic at the Boston Globe, and he recently won in 2012 a very well-deserved Pulitzer Prize for criticism. Uh, he's a phenomenal film critic, probably the best in the business. And we're also uh, thrilled to have with us Kelly Jackson, who is a Harvard College Fellow in the Department of African and African American Studies here at Harvard, and has just accepted a wonderful position at Hunter College as Assistant <laughs> Professor of History. She's written widely on political violence and history and film, uh, and she is currently teaching a class on slavery and film here at the university. So please welcome uh, our phenomenal commentators, and we're looking forward to a great debate. So I wanted to. Uh, Are we actually going to debate, by the way? We, gonna, we may. Is there? It's we going may. Down. <laughs> that is the hope. I'll, I'll just, I'm going to button my jacket. <laughs> so I did want to start a little bit with um, a kind of biographical question for you, Wesley. Um, I think it's rare to see an, a, a young African American film critic, and particularly one that's had the kind of professional success that you've had. And I was hoping that you might talk to us a bit about. Um, your approach to film criticism, how you got into it in the first place, uh, and how you're thinking about responding to questions of race uh, when reviewing films. Uh, OK, so whenever I tell the story about how I started doing this professionally, it usually takes 20 minutes, and it's <laughs> not that interesting. <laughs> but I'm always trying to find the most interesting and useful thing about the story. And as it turns out, there really isn't one. <laughs> so I mean, there's no, uh, there's no applicable lesson I can give anybody about like, how I became a film critic. And it happened kind of by accident. Mm -hmm. I just, I'd watch a lot of movies um, as a kid, but I'd never thought about writing seriously about them. And I got an assignment from a teacher in middle school who was, who was tired of book reports and wanted us, well, he wasn't tired of book reports. I think we were tired of book reports. <laughs> and so he said, all right, I'll cut you a break. Instead of reading this book that I've assigned you, there's a TV movie based on this book. Why don't you watch that and do a book report on that? Um, and I don't know. I, I had watched the movie, and I hated it. And I wrote the book <laughs> report about how I didn't like the movie. Right. Um, and it was, a, it was a Hallmark Hall of Fame production. It was 
a movie called, um, of this book called um, April Morning. I think it, I, I say it was a civil war, but I think it was a revolutionary war. <laughs> uh, and it was Rip Torn and Chris Lowe, or Chad Lowe. Um, anyway, this teacher encouraged me to continue to doing that. that. So I did it. And I wrote film reviews in college, and um, I lucked into a job at the San Francisco Chronicle. Mm -hmm. um, younger than I thought. I mean, it was just totally random. They were they didn't know what they were doing when they hired me, honestly. <laughs> I mean, they really didn't. I don't know what they thought was going to happen, but I think they we all just got lucky. Right. Um, and uh, I stayed there for three years, and I wound up here, and I stayed here for 11 years. I don't know if that really answers your question. But no, I mean, I think it does. And, and I mean, it's, it's always curious to me, um, you know, growing up, I, I read a lot of film criticism. I was sort of always obsessed with it. And, and one of the things I noticed is that the sorts of movies that me and my friends liked or me and my family liked, oftentimes African-American films, were just constantly uh, dismantled <laughs> in these, in these uh, reviews. And I sort of, and then I would read certain film critics, particularly um, Roger Ebert, mm -hmm. who I felt like often kind of gave these movies, a, you know, in retrospect, probably a bit higher scores than they really deserve. Yes. And he sort of had a, a politics behind that. And I was, and you don't quite do that. I mean, you, you have a very interesting take. It's not, I mean, it's not sort of harshly critical, but it's, it's, it's a more attuned approach to the aesthetic merits of some of these films that doesn't actually dismiss the, po the political implications. And so I was, I'm sort of hoping you could, you could talk about how you get out of the kind of trap of eat your spinach criticism, right? Like that you need to see this movie because it's about African Americans, even though it's bad, like a sort of red tails, <laughs> right? Yeah, but nobody should see red tails. Right. Like, right. don't see it, it's right. bad. <laughs> like, don't encourage them to keep making this right. stupid yeah. shit, right. don't go. <laughs> don't give George, George Lucas does not need your money. <laughs> the people responsible for that movie, I, like, you have sympathy for the actors, right? Oh, I love Nate Parker, mm -hmm. I want him to keep working. Well, Nate Parker, that's his agent's job. <laughs> that's not your job. And I don't, you know, I think the thing about Roger Ebert that's really interesting is, I remember as a kid watching the show that he had with Gene, with Gene Siskel, and I felt like they, there was one of the things about that show that's really it was really interesting to me and remains extremely interesting is it wasn't enough for them to like something they had to kind of explain what it was that they liked right. and every week with every movie that had a black theme most of the time Roger was on board and I found that as a person who either couldn't afford to go to a lot of movies um, or they often review movies that were never open. And I grew up in Philadelphia, and it was a pretty good movie-going city. Uh, but you know, there were a lot of things that just didn't open right. for whatever reason. And, and I understand now the vagaries of distribution and why that was probably was the case. But I, I probably would have been a harsher judge um, for some of those things. But I also felt like he felt a responsibility to the responsibility to get the audience for for that show to go see right. those movies and i i don't feel that responsibility and i think a little bit of what i don't a little bit of the of the leeway that i feel i might have in feeling that way is that other people will feel that for me i don't have mm -hmm. a lot of guilt <laughs> <laughs> about you know subject matter and that sort of thing um and i'm not saying that roger ebert and gene siskel siskel practiced this sort of guilty criticism, but I think that they were self-examining people who I think were also often enlightened by seeing a part of the world that they could only have seen through the movie. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think, you know, <laughs> I mean, I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up where a lot of those movies were set, but you know, in this, I'm talking about like the early 90s um, when a lot of the black movies that were being made were you know, gangsta dramas mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or gangsta action movies. And, you know, I heard, you know, I didn't live that life, but I mean, <laughs> I'm not unfamiliar with, right, right, yeah. right. with what it means were. to like live a few houses down from it right. um, or to have people not come to school one day because 
<laughs> they did something stupid over the weekend. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think it was interesting to watch that in a movie in a way that said to people, you know, you should, you should see this. Mm -hmm. This is how people live. Yeah. Um, I was sort of more watching it for whether or not it worked as a movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those movies didn't work as movies right. to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Kelly, I, w I wanted to ask you, I mean, you're coming at it from a totally different perspective, which is as a historian, and you know, one might polemically ask, uh, why should a historian teach film at all? Um, yeah. You know, it's this sort of history written in lightning problem yeah. that, you know, maybe it's not best that we uh, have our history digested that way, that the <laughs> historical imagination is, is determined in that way. Maybe we should be spending, particularly at college, time poring over the sort of comprehensive actual analytical text, text of sure. uh, I, historiography. Actually, I push back on that a little bit, only because now I'm seeing more and more that history and Hollywood in a lot of ways go hand in hand. I mean, when you see um, some films in Hollywood, the most powerful films usually begin with based on a true story, right? A lot of the films that become your big Oscar winners are the ones that are based on you know, World War II or mm -hmm. some sort of historical moment that we can all kind of have this nostalgia about or sense of belief about. Um, it's powerful because when you see a historical film like 12 Years a Slave or like Saving Private Ryan, um, you are not necessarily in this make-believe world like Avatar, right? You are experiencing <laughs> something that for the most part people believe is true and for the most part, is the closest that people will ever get to reading the actual or understanding mm. the actual historical moment. Um, so for me, I see Hollywood and history sort of feeding each other. A lot of the great stories that we all wanna see come out of history. Uh, the problem is, is that Hollywood's number one goal is, is to make money and to make mm. a profit. Um, and that's not the historian's bottom line. And so you see a lot of historians in Hollywood bunny heads because they're like, no, this didn't happen. No, no, that's not true. No, this is out of sequence. No, you know, there's a lot of contention between the two. Um, but being able to have a class on film and history is so wonderful because you can compare what's actually happening, but then you can also sort of deconstruct and dissect what's not true and why is it being shown as, as um, unfaithful to the text. What is the agenda behind the director? What are historians actually saying? I think in a lot of ways it makes you go deeper. One of the best films to do that was Glory. Glory, um, it's not a particularly great film when you look at the history, the actual history behind it. Um, but what Glory did was spark so much conversation about the presence of black soldiers in the Civil War. Um, even though in the film all the black soldiers are slaves and in the history all the black soldiers are free men, some people right. who've never seen slavery. Right. Um, but there's something powerful about that, that now in the classroom, we have discussions taking place about the Civil War, about the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, that never would have happened had not Glory been out there um, for people to see. So in a lot of ways, film is a catalyst to these larger historical conversations that need to take place, like, like 12 Years a Slave. Well, speaking of 12 Years a Slave, <laughs> um, I'm curious as to, as to um, Actually, can we, can we show the first clip? Um, I think it's, it's clip number two. <sighs> you admit it. Yes, freely. No, clip number you two. You know why? I got this from Mistress Shaw. Sorry. Cause I know we get where we're traveling. Wish we'd die trying. Survival's not about certain death. It's about keeping your head down. Days ago, I was with my family. In my home. Now you tell me all is lost. Tell no one who I am. That's the way to survive. Well, I don't want to survive. I want to live. So, thinking about 12 Years a Slave and the way it's just been showered with accolades, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
there was a film critic at New York Magazine who right after the Toronto Film Festival where it premiered, sort of rushed to the keyboard to declare the race for best he picture. Go to his, <laughs> he did it from his phone. His phone right? <laughs> I watched him leave the theater. <laughs> Uh, and so, I, so I'm thinking, you know, there's a there's a there's a response to this, um, and I think Frank Rich is a kind of elegant take on it, where he says, um, you know, it's essentially like Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, you know, in the, in the character Miss Ophelia, who says, you know, this is perfectly horrible. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves, and let's and then Frank Rich says, and let's be honest, the fact that you should be ashamed of yourselves is the uh, message of 12 Years a Slave to a white audience. It's the message we knew going in. Mm -hmm. And the problem with films like this, according to Rich, is that you know you sort of cry in the theater, mm -hmm. and then you walk out feeling good about yourself. Um, mm -hmm. The Golden Globes opened with a joke from Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. Mm -hmm. And Amy Poehler says, you know, 12 Years a Slave really changed the way I thought about slavery. And then Tina Fey says, well, wait, how are you thinking about <laughs> slavery? <laughs> yeah. um, so, so there's this sense of like, you know, however well it's done, we kind of know this, right? Mm -hmm. what's, what's, the, what's the aesthetic achievement of something so mm -hmm. familiar? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I mean, for me, I feel like the, the achievement of that movie was, I mean, there's the political achievement, right, in the context of, you know, the sort of cinematic political achievement, which is that it is the first movie made by a black person about slavery at, to the degree that this movie is is sort of wholly about slavery. There have been other movies that black directors have, have sort of made around slavery, and but this is the first to actually to deal with it head on, um, and not just with the sort of task of 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 slavery, but with all the politics that we all the sort of domestic politics that we understand to have been evident. Um, on the on the plantations, and you know there are a lot of like little things that I think are amazing about this movie that that aren't just about the fact that Steve McQueen is black mm -hmm. and the subject mm -hmm. is slavery. They're also like things that that only a person who really cared about doing it the right way did. I mean, in the movies, you go to these plant, you see these plantations, and they're like yeah. these. It's like Tara. Every movie, <laughs> every every plantation <laughs> in the movies is like Scarlett yeah. O'Hara's mm -hmm. plantation. I was amazed by how small the farms were yeah. mm -hmm. and how it just was, it wasn't a business, it was, it was the engine for the household right. first. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of little things, I mean, I guess I knew these things, but actually watching them dramatized in this way and having the sort of the, the same larger stakes played out that intimately was a revelation. Um, but I, d I don't know. I don't agree with most of the stuff in that Frank Rich piece. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I, don't, I don't dispute it because, I mean, basically what he's writing about is how the movie, how he, how he claims the movie makes a white audience feel. Yeah. But I think that that is something that he, I mean, he doesn't have the luxury of feeling that way, but I do think that what I respond to with this film is that it doesn't really care who the audience is. Mm -hmm. It it's not for anybody. Mm -hmm. It what you whatever whatever happens to you when you leave this movie is your problem. It's not Steve McQueen, and trust me, he is a director who very easily could have made the right. the bad version of this, right. yeah. which is all about like damn you white people, <laughs> damn you. <laughs> but I I don't think th the movie isn't inflected in that way, mm -hmm. and I think the point of view and its containment don't sort of lay the problem at any particular person's feet or any particular race's feet. Um, I think it's a much smarter, much more sensitive movie than that. And I think that the thing that surprised me about that Frank Rich thing was that was how much it was sort of led by guilt. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he wasn't making a case for the movie making him feel those things. He was sort of making a sort of extra historical mm -hmm. argument that really didn't bear out in the in the nuts and bolts of the actual filmmaking, right. um, but I mean I get I get where he's coming from. I just feel like he was aiming it at the wrong movie, mm. um, and it was a convenient movie to sort of make that argument about. Right, right. 
I, I would say um, when I saw 12 Years a Slave, there was a private screening at, at Harvard. And it was interesting because when the credits rolled, no one moved. Mm. Like, no one moved. Um, and it was, OK, so I saw it, I felt like, in two different ways. The historian side of me was like, whoa, this is spot on. Because in a lot of films, they're so far off the track that uh, How this. How do you mean? So far off the track in terms of this never would have happened in slavery. This is not possible in slavery. This is an exaggeration of slavery. Mandingo fighting. Uh, Mandingo mm -hmm. fighting, yeah. all, uh, especially with Django. Um, so this film, a lot of the text that I was assigning in my class, it was as though they had taken a passage and put that same theme um, within the film. The one critique that I have about the film is not so much about how it was shot or how it was done or what concepts they're talking about, but the kind of overall agenda of why this story? Mm -hmm. Why Solomon Northrup? Why 12 Years a Slave? I think part of the agenda in choosing this story is that the audience can identify with Solomon because they see him as this exceptional free black person who doesn't deserve to be enslaved. And so when you see his story, you're not so much captivated by the guilt of slavery itself. It's the guilt that almost he doesn't deserve to be here, which I find intensely problematic because mm, yeah. when you look at someone like Patsy or all of the other slaves in the film, it's kind of like, oh, well, you were born in slavery, so we don't feel bad for you, right? Like this sort of exceptionalism that we make in order to feel something for someone, not because slavery is problematic, but because, no, they were once free, right? That's intensely troubling. Um, and but I don't you sort of feel like the the alternative argument to that is well the people who were there just they, well they deserve to be <laughs> yeah 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 because Solomon was free but eh, you guys do you get my question is do you get the same story do you get the same sympathy had it not been twelve years a slave but the story of Harriet Tubman or the story of Frederick Douglass or the story of Henry Highland Garnett or any other former enslaved person do you feel that same sort of empathy for them? as someone who was born into slavery as you do for someone like Solomon? Well, I mean, I, I would like to put this on the table. I mean, I think ex exceptionalism is the, a theme that runs throughout all of these films mm -hmm. that we've been speaking about so far, 12 Years a Slave, Django, mm -hmm. um, even Fruitvale Station, which I, mm -hmm. I, I want to turn to as well. Uh, there's a great quote, uh, actually, you know, um, right as the master cuts Solomon Northrup down from the tree, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's only in the tree because he had displayed engineering prowess and, uh, and had antagonized a white overseer mm -hmm. on the plantation who struck back at him. Uh, and the white slave owner cuts him down and says, you're an exceptional nigger, Platt, but mm -hmm. I fear no good will come of it. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a great quote in Django where Leonardo DiCaprio as Calvin Candy gives this speech where, he, you know, he's very into phrenology, the measurement of skulls to determine racial inferiority. And he says, where I depart from my phrenologist colleagues is I believe there is a level above bright, above talented, above loyal that a nigger can aspire to. Say, one nigger that just pops up in 10,000, the exceptional nigger. But I do believe that in time, exceptional niggers like Bright Boy here, he's speaking to Django, uh, become, if not frequent, more frequent. Bright Boy, you are that one in 10,000. And that's when Django kills everyone at the end. He declares, <laughs> you know, Calvin Candy was only right about one thing. I am that one nigger in 10,000. Uh, so, I mean, there's, a, there's an embrace. I think, you know, McQueen mm -hmm. has a kind of ambivalence about the exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. Tarantino is outright embracing it. Yeah. Um, and but I want to know about, how... You, well, yeah, if I could interrupt. The thing about Fruitville, though, is that Oscar Grant's not exceptional, exactly, right? Exactly. He's got a criminal record. He's got a temper. He is flawed. He is not someone you would look at and, and necessarily be prone to feel bad for or to feel empathy for. But the success of the film is that by the end of it, you feel as though you've come to know Oscar Grant in a, in a special way. You see that he may be not adored by society, but he's ad adored by his daughter and he's loved by his mother. And that's the beauty of Fruitville, is that it's able to take someone who we kind of see as an expendable in society and make you see them as a human being. Instead of taking that exceptional magic Negro and then saying, oh, we should feel bad for him, it's taking this person that we cast away and saying, 
let's finally see this person as a human being, as a father, as a son, as someone who's trying. Um, that was to me, to me, Fruitville was the most powerful film of the year and the most underrated film of the year. I felt like it totally got the shaft when it came to the Oscars. That's not to say that 12 Years a Slave wasn't good, but again, it's the agenda. What do we want to praise? Do we want <coughs> to praise the exceptionalism of black people? Or do we want to have films like Fruitville that push back on that exceptionalism? I don't think Hollywood's ready for that image yet. No. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> I would agree, which is why, I mean, that is, I mean, it's not a Hollywood movie. Um, and I think that you, I mean, I can't think of anything. I mean, I'm a little more ambivalent about Fruitvale Station. Um, but I think the, the place where you and I meet up is uh, its intent. Mm -hmm. Like, it really is aware of all the movies that have gone before it, mm -hmm. all the news reports. Um, and it wants to sort of, it wants to redeem not just Oscar Grant, mm -hmm. but every black male yeah. who has either gone through the Hollywood meat grinder mm -hmm. or the media meat grinder, mm -hmm. um, and to sort of restore some sort of humanness, mm -hmm. um, to that. But you think you it know, falls short? I don't think it falls short of that. I think as a movie, I think there's a lot of, its power sort of comes in restaging the, the most tragic aspect of the Oscar Grant story, mm -hmm. which is the shooting. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think before that, it really did feel like a movie from 1991, both in mm. a good way mm. and in a bad way. Mm. Um, I mean, this is, it's Ryan Coogler's first movie. Yeah, I mean, right, he'd right. never made a movie before. I think he was he was subsequently, I think the excitement around that film sort of automatically cast it in a light that was maybe, and the fact that the Weinstein Company picked it up to distribute, it just sort of, it it it, it cast it in this light that I don't think it really was prepared to handle as mm. a as a piece of filmmaking. Mm. Um, but I'm, I am more than capable of setting that aside and looking at, you know, without sort of not dealing with what the movie's actual structural problems are. I just, I was very moved by, mm -hmm. by the intent of, mm -hmm. of, by the sort of conscious attempt on behalf of Ryan Coogler to sort of restore, you know, a, humanity to to Oscar Grant. I mean, not not so much in the eyes of anybody who knew him or lived in in, in the Bay Area, because I think that the media really did cover the hell out of that story. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that for people who didn't know that happened, and but you know, who might have known that something else along right. those lines had happened, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a way that you can lose sight of of the actual person and everybody is sort of this, you know, featureless, you know, the, what are the... The hoodie at the end. Yeah, I mean, yeah. or, yeah, yeah. The, just the, yeah. the figure that you don't see. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked a lot about black men uh, in this story so far, and I was, I was wondering what you would say about Precious in this vein, um, because here's another, <laughs> well, here's a, I mean, here's another arguably um, successful attempt uh, to humanize somebody who's deeply unexceptional. I mean, mm -hmm. only exceptional in the, to the extent of the enormous uh, burdens and problems she's forced to bear. Uh, your review of it was, um, was, was, it was extraordinarily favorable, um, but you seem to be I much more ambivalent precious. about <laughs> it. <laughs> I did. I hated Precious for a lot of reasons. And um, part of it was sort of the imagery of Precious itself, I think, or Precious herself, is that um, the director, Lee Daniels, talked about how he was kind of disgusted and repulsed by people um, like Precious and how mm. this film was sort of a way to kind of give that person or give that person humanity. Um, and I felt like it failed at that miserably. I felt like I cringed a lot through watching um, Precious. And it's not so much about the politics of respectability, right? But for me, it was about how this imagery of Precious 
is was being received by audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of felt, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a theater and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed, right? <laughs> like, I don't, and, and you're almost torn as to how people are receiving what, what she looks like. And to me, um, aside from her physical appearance, the story has no happy ending, right? The story doesn't no. end with her kind of walking off into the sunset victorious. She picks up like the subway. Yeah, yeah <laughs> she picks up the she's, subway. She's, she's got two HIV, kids with yeah, special HIV needs. Positive. She's got HIV. She has all of these issues. And I'm like, and I'm supposed to now feel what? Like, there's no victory in all in this film. And not that necessarily victory is necessary, but I think the way that Lee Daniels is, is telling this story, I think Precious becomes fetishized in some way that is um, disturbing. Um, but it's interesting that you brought up Precious just because when you think about all the films that have been made within this new black renaissance era, be it 42 or Fruitville or The Butler or Mandela, um, they're all historical films for the most part, but they all have a male at the center mm -hmm. of them. There are no real prominent female leads. Um, even though Lupita Nyong'o wins the um, Oscar for Best Supporting Actress, if you even think about the amount of scripts that she has within the film, it's, it's not very significant. Um, there are not a lot of historical roles of women that are prominent within Hollywood. A lot of times these stories are told through men, and when they're told through women, they fail. I think like Precious, like Beloved, like Daughters of the Dust that all five people saw, I mean, they don't get the sort of traction that men do. You mean commercial traction? I'd say or commercially, and then even, I would even say praise-wise, in terms of how they're viewed, they're not lauded in that same sort of respect. Um, and even, and I, I started looking at sort of Oscar statistics and noticed that um, there's way more African-American men who have won an, an Academy Award than women have. And the men who have won, over half of them have played actual people, actual historical characters. But when you look at the roles that black women have won for, they're either slaves or maids, um, and these sort of fictional, stereotypical characters. You, I've yet to see, I'm trying to think, I don't want to tell a lie, of a black woman who's won an Oscar for playing a historical person that was not a slave or a maid. Angela Bassett should have won. Angela Bassett should have won. She was robbed. She was robbed. No, I'm, no, that's that's true. I mean, I think that the question. I mean, you know, I, I think one of the things that you then have to ask is, you know, who is who's making the movies, mm -hmm. um, and what is. I mean, I would. I mean, sort of psychologically. I. I mean, psychologically. Psychologically applied to the sort of filmmaking apparatus, like what it is about resisting stories about black women. And I think it, I think there is a way in which the sort of bedrock of, of movie going or movie making and of storytelling in the movies in the United States along the lines of race have required black women to, they began as servants, mm. and it's such a foundational relationship. I mean, between mm -hmm. black women and the and the white characters in a movie. Mm -hmm. And I think what was I mean, and I don't have any sort of yeah. sort of psychosocial explanation for why that has remained fixed. Mm -hmm. I'm more fascinated for un, in, in unpacking why it has remained fixed as mm -hmm. opposed to like why it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. But the thing that was amazing for me about Precious mm -hmm. is that it is the same person, like physically, mm -hmm. who began in the movies. I mean, that is the sort of thing that the movies have always sort of been uncomfortable with, a dark mm -hmm. skin, mm -hmm. heavy set woman. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed by how Lee Daniels in his sort of trashy, sort of the the, the Lee Daniels way. <laughs> I mean, there's no other. I mean, he's I mean, he's a he's a really interesting filmmaker, and I there's nobody like him on earth. Um, and I think that his 
applying that style to this movie problem, mm -hmm. which then obviously first before it's a movie problem is a social problem, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just found that really exciting to see him trust this, this actor, mm -hmm. Gabri Sidibe, with a, with a part that should, that should make everybody who's ever been to a movie uncomfortable because mm -hmm. that character has never been a person in a movie. Mm. She's been a functionary. Mm -hmm. And to give her, pro I mean, oh, I'm open to the argument about her being pathologized, mm -hmm. And and, to, and like why that needs to be put in an entertainment. Um, that's sort of a separate question for me, uh, not an inextricably separate question, but a separate question for me from the fact that it seemed somewhat revolutionary at the same time. Mm. Um, and I actually don't think that he, I don't think he thinks that the ending of that movie is, is necessarily triumphant. I do think, I mean, I think it's a more lateral, I mean, this is better than, you know, living with, with the Monique character. Yeah. Which, I mean, again, is more, pro mm -hmm. and it's a lot of problems. But it doesn't take much to be better than right, living right, with right, the right. Monique no, character. That's I mean, that's, <laughs> but I mean, there, it's there is a question about her, I mean, her s sort of self-development, right? So, that, I mean, literacy right, plays she a is, central role. She's mm -hmm. taught to role, read. Right. She is taught to, to love and be open. Mm -hmm. And the women who are teaching her this are, like, black lesbians. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of... I love the community aspect of that movie, too. Mm -hmm. Like, they didn't ship her off to a boarding school. Right. You know, yeah. like, Maggie Smith didn't come in and, like, right. teach her how to talk <laughs> properly. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. Paula Patton did it. Yeah. Right. It was... Yeah. It was I mean, and I like the girls in the class. I mean, there mm -hmm. were a lot of, there are a lot of problems with that movie, but I think the, the sort of guiding spirit of that film is totally new and was, it felt totally new to me and totally authentic. And he has such a voice as a filmmaker that is very much about him. And he's, you know, there's a kind of egotism with him, but I think that the project of, of turning over a fourth of that movie to those girls mm -hmm. and that those those classroom scenes and you know all the stuff that shot out from 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 inside them was really interesting mm -hmm. and exciting and I mean I'm totally open to where you are and I th but I also think that as a movie it it does force all audiences because that movie made I mean, it might have made $40 million, $50 mm -hmm. million, mm -hmm. which is a lot of money yeah. for a so movie like that, like that mm -hmm. where no cars crash or, yeah. you know. And so I, I, I think that I had a lot of conversations with people who had, you know, never seen anybody like this in a movie before. And I thought, well, I mean, there's some there's some value in that. And I, well, what do you mean you never seen anybody like this in a movie before? I've never seen a movie about a normal black girl. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, well, you think she's normal? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Problematic. I mean, it's oh. the, uh, it's tough, you know. I think that sometimes I wish I were like one fifth less intelligent about some of this stuff. It would make a lot of things easier to watch. Yeah. You know, you can check out a little bit more. I feel like it, it's hard because you feel like you I'm responsible for yeah. for explaining exactly what happens with with, you know, as, as a black male, I, I feel an extra responsibility to sort of unpack yeah. what as is actually woman, happening. I feel the same, right. yeah. exact same way. And I can't I can't let a movie get away with something that's problematic. Mm -hmm. If it's succeeding at like 60 percent of what it sets out to do. It's kind of a success. <laughs> <laughs> Take what you can get. You know, and it's not, and I don't mean that backhandedly. I mean, 60% is better than movies that have no agenda. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like with a movie like Precious, I was really at, a, at an interesting place, like, with a response. Like, where do I start? Mm -hmm. Do I start with the energy that I felt coming out of the theater? I saw that movie in France. I saw that movie at the Cannes Film Festival after it wow. premiered in, at Sundance and Oprah and Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry went crazy and wanted to get behind it and like make sure everybody saw it. Um, I saw it with French people. And you know how French people are with black people? They, <laughs> they just think everything we do is awesome. 
Um, black, black Americans. <laughs> black Americans. Sorry. No, I sorry. Should if, <laughs> I, I should have been clear. If you're actually an African in France, yeah. sorry. Not awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, but African Americans hold this sort of special right, fascination right, with right. French people. And when Precious ended, they stood up and applauded. And I mean, I knew th that I had seen something special, but like they took it to some other, you know, they just sort of leap right over their own problems and focus on ours. And it that was an interesting moment because it, it sort of, I didn't know as a writer and as a thinker, like where to begin unpacking why I liked it and why I think it really works, mm -hmm. right. knowing fully well that there are things in that movie that you also have to deal with because they don't work or they do connect with this other longer history of how black yeah. women in movies are treated. Which is why yeah. I think there, there's very, for me, visual, very little visual divergence between this big black woman who is seemingly unattractive, how, um, she differs from the Mammy character that you see on the screen, how she differs from Monique visually, how she differs from um, any other overweight black woman. Um, she doesn't veer too much from that stereotype. And, the, and I feel like the converse of that is also the light-skinned, attractive woman who is also somewhat hypersexualized. Um, I have yet to see, I think the film would have been different for me had Precious been perceived as someone who is not so disturbed, but show us a black woman who is overweight and intelligent and smart and beautiful. Well, and that's, that's something end up you don't see on film. No, Precious, sure. Precious, I feel like I've seen in so many di different incarnations that it wasn't, um, it wasn't a huge divergence from the stereotype well, for me. Um, we actually need to, to start to take questions. Oh. We have, <laughs> we have uh, run out of time pretty quickly. Um, but if you guys could line up at the microphones, if you have a question, uh, and then we'll take them in order. Um, is there anything that you wanted to, is there anything like outstanding that you want to? There's plenty of outstanding, <laughs> but it's I, like, is there I like want to reward thing? the people who've tracked okay. out here. Um, so I think there are all sorts of great topics on the table about historical representation and the politics of respectability and the sort of trap, right? Because even if you were your last comment, we might end up back in a paradox of <laughs> yeah. looking for exceptions. Yes, again. that's true too. Um, that's true so too. we'll take uh, this gentleman, and if you could do me one favor, you identify yourself when you ask a question, tell us what your name is, your affiliation, uh, try to keep your question very, very brief, and please actually make it a question. Uh, <laughs> as much as we love your speeches, we prefer they end with a question mark. So. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, big Grantline fan. Um, love, love your writing. Love Rembrandt's writing. Love Bill Simmons. And I was just curious how, like, when, what attracted you to what was like supposedly a sports site, and what, mm -hmm. like, how did they pitch that to you, and how did they get you to come, and sort of what was the draw Great. for you? Great. Uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I. I'd been working at the Globe. I had I had started a sports blog that nobody knew I had started, where I was just writing about things that athletes wear when they play sports, not uniforms because uniforms don't really interest me unless they're interesting, um, but like more about what n more about what athletes wear. More like style. It's not so much the clothes. It's more about the way the clothes are worn, um, and so I had written, I think the first thing I put on the on this blog was about the men's final in 2010 between Roger Federer and Andy Roddick. And how clean Andy Roddick, I mean how clean Roger Federer looked for the entire match. It didn't seem like Roger Federer had sweated at all. Um, and Andy Roddick, <laughs> like from the first game, it seemed like he was soaking wet. <laughs> and he never changed his shirt. Although that match went on, it was like 16-14 in the fifth, it had to have, <laughs> It, he had to have changed his shirt. I don't remember him doing it, but it didn't matter. He just looked completely ready to work, and like he had worked that entire match. And Roger Federer, nothing, like not a drop of sweat. Um, and I just was really struck by that, how Roger Federer sort of dresses for cleanliness and Andy Roddick <laughs> dresses for sports. Um, and I just was, I don't know. I mean, nobody, who was writing about that? And, <laughs> 
so I started <laughs> writing about it. Um, and I didn't tell anybody I was doing it, and I didn't want to say anything until I'd finished 10 entries. And it took about nine months to do 10. Um, and a friend of mine knew Bill and knew that Bill was starting the site, and he told Bill that this is something Bill should think about having on the site. And so Bill asked me to do it for them, and I said, sure. Um, and then as the site started to work, I mean, people seemed to like it, and Great the writing seemed mm -hmm. good. Um, and the numbers were, the traffic numbers were, were really strong. Um, they asked me if I wanted to do film reviews for them and I didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to do it so I waited a while and then eventually I just said yes. It didn't seem like, I don't know, it, it, I mean, it seemed like a really good opportunity to try something that I was terrified to do, um, which was to leave the, it doesn't, I'm gonna say the comforts of the newspaper and you're gonna laugh because <laughs> ha ha ha, newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> but newspapers, they're a family. And I had been in the newspaper since 2002. And mm -hmm. it, was the, it was the longest job I'd ever had. Mm -hmm. And those people were my family. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't, I wasn't happy to leave. Um, and I felt like the paper was in good enough shape for me not to, if I had stayed, I wouldn't be in terrible career trouble. Um, and I liked working at, that, at the Globe. It was great. Um, but I also felt like I'd been there for a while and I'd, all right, I'll, I'll work for Bill Simmons and see how that is. Um, and it's, so far it's been a year and a half and it's been really good. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. Right here. Hello, uh, my name is Fadal Moore. I'm a junior here at the college. So I guess my question sort of centers around this concept of the exceptional Negro and Oscar Grant. Mm -hmm. So we talked about um, the protagonist, Ashamedly, I have not seen 12 Years a Slave yet. Um, the protagonist of 12 Years a Slave um, being the exceptional Negro and Django, and Django Unchained being the exceptional Negro. But then we pointed to Oscar Grant and said that he wouldn't be an example of, a of an exceptional Negro. And I was, just, I was just wondering, like, could he possibly be an example for a certain type of audience, right? People who see America via this sort of merit meritocratic context where you sort of, your, your place in life is determined on like what you earned or like what you decide to do, right? And Oscar Grant is, pre is presented as this person who like kind of doesn't want this place in life. He decides to stop selling weed. You know, he pours the weed back out into the right. ocean, mm -hmm. whatever. He decides to be the good father. People who assume that, you know, black men may not all be good fathers like he is mm -hmm. in his- He comforts um, the dying dog. Yeah, exactly, right? So is it, pos is it possible that he could, that's for certain people that he could be seen as an exceptional, exceptional Negro? I think for the movie, sure. I mean, the one, the tragedy is this was a guy who was trying to change his life. Yeah. I mean, he'd screwed up, and at every point, at every stop along the way to that Bart, to you know, to that New Year's, to being pulled off that train, um, this was the person who was in the process of successfully turning his life mm -hmm. around. I. <laughs> I only I only say not I don't that that see, makes him not, exceptional yeah, in the way that, that we've that been talking about exceptional. Exactly, I think um, I think Oscar Grant represents the expendable and not the exceptional. Mm. So that scene where where the bulldog, uh, not the, pit, the pit bull, is hit by the car. Um, I remember the was it the director or one of the actors was talking about how that scene, of course, never happens, but that um, he put it in because he felt like the pit bull represented black men in America, right? They're this big, ferocious dog that people are threatened by or terrified by, um, and that they're kind of discarded. It's, it's a clear hit and run when the guy hits the pit bull and he keeps on going. And it's almost a foreshadow of kind of like what happens to Oscar Grant's life, that he is mm -hmm. this expendable person who's kind of hit and then discarded. Um, and so I think he represents for a lot of people what the expendable in society looks like, not so much the exceptional. Um, at least that's how I see it. But I could see how you could say like the attempt to change his life around make him exceptional. Um, but at the end of the day, how he's viewed, how he's kind of discarded, is so emblematic of how many black men in America are, are treated. Not so much as being exceptional, but as being expendable. Okay. Um, so we, let's let's try to keep questions short, answers short, so we can get a few more in. Um, hi, my name is Carolina, and I am a freshman at the college. And my question is, 
you guys spoke a lot about films that address um, social issues uh, or have something to do with a historical event. Um, but what is your take on movies like those that Tyler Perry makes mm -hmm. that are specifically directed towards the black community? Oh, that. <laughs> I think I love Tyler Perry. I mean, I love him because I'll just, I'm sure this is going to, like, since it's going to go on Twitter right now. I love him. But, I mean, I have wrestled with this man now for <laughs> five years. And I have, I have gone, I have moved on to so many places on that, on the, on the, on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was initially baffled. And I, as a person who, who was at the barber shop watching the plays while I waited for my haircut. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the, my barber wouldn't take an appointment because he knew he didn't have to. And so I'd have to sit there, and I'd be there for like two hours, and you'd watch the same Medea play. <laughs> yeah. You come in right at the middle, and be like, "What?" And then you start; they'd play it all over again for like the next. You get a little bit of overlap, and you, oh, I see. Uh, she, oh, okay. They're all having an affair. Oh, I got it. Um, and so when Diary of a of a, of a Mad Black Woman, Woman came yeah. out, I was like, well. Why did this take so long? <laughs> this is the these movies, these plays, like just put it, just release the plays in the movie theater. <laughs> um, but the first movie was so bad, and he didn't direct it. <laughs> but it was it was terrible. But you know, if you, over time, I realized this is the guy who really was. He directed the second film, and he really wanted to get better as something. Not not mm -hmm. as a director as a cultural force who really believed in the force of his, of his, of his entertainment abilities. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the audience has followed. He had every reason to believe in it. And I think that by the time he made For Color Girls, I was like, OK, this is a guy who is clearly, he's not Lee Daniels. He's not like a, like a, like a weird genius. He's not even a genius. He just works really hard and is <laughs> yeah. throwing stuff at the wall, and something is going to stick. <laughs> yeah. And by God. <laughs> I hope it's Antisaki Shange. <laughs> and I just was, ha I like him for my purposes because I get to write about when it works, when it doesn't work, what it means, what people mm -hmm. like about him. I think that for audiences, I do believe that it's now a saw, but like, you know, something that people just say because it just seems true. But I think it actually was true when it, when it happened. And that was that he, there was an audience that Hollywood was actively not yeah. making movies for. Yeah. And they were all kinds of different black people. A lot of them went to church. Mm -hmm. And they just wanted to go to the movies. And mm -hmm. they, I mean, they don't, ultimately, I don't know anybody who's like, oh, that's a white movie. I'm not going to see that. <laughs> but it was nice to be able to go to a movie and just, you know, see Kimberly Elise. Yeah. And have her be the star of a movie instead of, you know, a best friend, girlfriend, something expendable. Um, and I think that he put himself out of business. He is putting himself out of business. He is so he was so successful. He created a little cottage industry, a cottage industry for himself. Mm -hmm. And I think now there are other people who are kind of better at what he does, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they are challenging him. Mm -hmm. And he, I don't know if he'll have an answer. I think will be a much more effective producer mm -hmm. of other people's work. I'm not saying he should give up on what he's doing, but I think that. He has been really good for black entertainment because he's made people think about what they're buying when they buy a ticket to his movies. And he has introduced this idea of snobbery. He has reintroduced an idea of snobbery <laughs> among black people. Um, and I, you know, I've been a part of some really interesting conversations about whether he's good, is he bad yeah. for us? <laughs> well, no, we're yeah. talking about him and he's making yeah. money and he's hiring black people to do stuff. His crews are yeah. black. His cast are mostly yeah. black. I mean, and of color. Like, agree with not you. just black. I mean, yeah. Asian, Latino. Yeah. Like, he hires everybody to make his movies. And I, I think that's only good. That's only good. Yeah, I agree. Next question. Yeah. Um, I'm Tafta, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, I wanted to ask, um, going back to Fruitvale Station and juxtaposing it to a film that I really enjoyed, um, Menace to Society. Um, and kind of the portrayal of black men in that film, where um, I think of um, O Dog or Shoe Dog, I'm trying to remember. Yes, O Dog. Yeah. O -Dog. I think of O Dog and like 
that's like to we want to say expendable kind of portrayal of a black man. Like that's really I think um, a more um, empty or abysmal kind of portrayal. I mm-hmm. wanted you to kind of like t- you guys to talk about that versus portrayals we see now with um, Fruitvale Station. I think of like Boys in the Hood and like Do the Right Thing, kind mm-hmm. of all those city inner city type of films. Hmm. You had mentioned that earlier when you were talking about how parts of Fruitville have that, is that the film that you were talking mm-hmm, about? Mm-hmm. Have that sort of uh, early 1990s um, vibe to it, I guess. Um, gosh, some of these films I haven't seen in so long. Um, and Minutes to Society, is is it 20 years it'll be out? Yeah, it's 20 years. It's yeah. 20, 20 years? 20 years. It was 20 years last 20 year. year. 20 years last year for Minutes to Society. Um, to me, I felt like Fruitville is a little bit different than those films in that Fruitville, for me, had a much more political intention behind it. Um, that the expectation when you saw Fruitville was to take it a little bit more seriously because, again, based on a true story, right? So the expectation of when you watch Fruitville is a little bit different than when you're watching Minister Society or Boys in the Hood. That's not to say that those films don't have some sort of merit or based in truth narrative. Um, but Fruitville, I think, is, a, is to me in a different category purely because of its political intent but behind you, it and I the mean, moment that it's addressing. Don't you think the politics, though, are, I mean, they're of that era. They're black nationalist politics, right? So um, the, the, the claim is that there's a nihilism mm-hmm. affecting young black mm-hmm. males in the ghetto. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that creeps into their core, right, their ontological core. The only explanation that we get in the course of minister society for why old dog does what he does is that he's young, black, and doesn't give a, you know. Yeah. Um, that's, that's it. We don't, we don't go into his home life. We don't know anything about him beyond that. Um, you know, we, we know he's friends with Cain, but we don't get any peek into his life. He's just mm-hmm. sort of this ontological thug. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a way in which... The, the, if you if you accept that premise, <coughs> which I, I don't, but mm-hmm. I think it was popular social theory at the time, yeah. that there needs to be some kind of communal response, right? Mm-hmm. That the, the movie ends, and if you haven't seen it, shame on you, I'm gonna ruin the ending. <laughs> um, but there is, it's a, I, I find the ending sort of powerful in, in the way that, you know, he says, my grandfather asked me, do I care whether I live or I die? Mm-hmm. And as, you know, as he's dying, he says, well, yeah, now I do. And there, there's something about, can, can this community somehow rally to instill a faith in mm-hmm. the value of life and the yeah. relationships that abound and the, and the and a kind of uh, community ethos rising to challenge that sort of um, nihilism? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I mean I think that's sort of how the the picture fits together. It's still political, but it's political in a in a much more black nationalist sense. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I that is true. I feel like there are more interesting storytelling solutions to yeah, that sure. problem. Mm-hmm. I sure. mean, I feel like I think about that movie, I thought a lot about that movie while I watched Clockers, for mm-hmm. instance, Spike Lee's interpretation of a Richard Price novel uh, that I think is actually very underrated as a Spike Lee mm-hmm. movie. Um, it's got this amazing shot toward the end of Strike, who's played by Mackay Pfeiffer, on a train, you know, magically freed from the, the crime that he should have gone to jail for, but Harvey, the cops, the detective, let, nice white detective lets him off. He's on this train headed to the Southwest and just the shot that he keeps on Mackay Pfeiffer's face, Spike Lee, of, of him looking at, like sitting in one of those widescreen Amtrak trains where you just look at the vistas. For, I don't know how long, but I mean, it's just him sort of total, well, He's, it's Mackay Pfeiffer, he's not much of an actor at that point. It's his first movie, but you get the point. Like, he is totally astonished by seeing a part of the world that he had never seen before. Right. And I just feel like, okay, well that's, this is the other way you solve this problem mm-hmm. as, a, you know, as a storyteller, is to sort of, I'm not, I don't think that the Hughes brothers had an obligation to be optimistic about it, but I felt like, yeah. They were taking a pose as opposed to arguing for right, something. Right. Um, sure. And I, I just didn't, I didn't buy that no, I think solution right. to that social problem. Right. Um, or, the, or the account of the social problem. Right. Because right. it's, I mean, they just define it 
Right. Mm -hmm. like, this thing is happening. That's who he is, right? Yeah. He's right. young black, and, yeah. and that's all we need to know. Yeah. Um, great. Right here. Hi, I'm Carrie, and I'm a sophomore at the college. And I was wondering what you think the importance of who's writing the screenplay plays into the way that a film, especially dealing with black history, um, is portrayed and received by an audience. So I was wondering if you noticed any tropes or patterns that come up based upon if a story is in the hands of a white writer or a black writer or someone of another ethnicity, but if mm -hmm. you know, audience reception and the aesthetics of the film are dictated by the script itself. Mm. That's a good question. I, I feel like there's so much that goes into a film um, than just the screenplay, right? Um, it's also the director's vision. It's also the corporate, what their desires are, what they think will sell, what they think will be marketable. Um, it's a real, it's a huge machine, you know? And there are a lot of factors that determine the certain flavor that comes out in the <coughs> end. The script is a big part of that, um, but it's, it's not the sole everything. When I, I read the script for um, 12 Years a Slave, and what you see on, on the page is not necessarily what comes out on, on the film. Certain things get cut, certain lines get cut. Um, certain things are different when you see them visually as opposed to reading them on the paper. Um, there's a lot that goes in. There's so many people that are a part of making a film what it is. Um, but I do think that there's intense amounts of underrepresentation when it comes to people of color, when it comes to women, in terms of who is shaping the story, who is telling the story, who is casting the story. Mm. Um, all of those things are so um, complex that it's never just one person that just kind of like, this is the deal. It's so many competing voices. And the fact that so few people of color and women are within the industry um, skews, I think, a lot of what we a lot of what we see. So when I was saying you know, earlier about how when you see films about slavery, they're almost always told from a male perspective, <coughs> um, the, the film industry is dominated by men, white men in particular. Um, it makes it extremely difficult to get out films that don't um, sort of, that sort of combat that image or that power structure. So um, it's, it sounds easy to just say who's writing the script, but it's so much more. I think casting that. is a huge, yeah. I just watched Divergent uh, last week. Was it last week that I did that? Maybe two weeks ago? Um, no, that was last week. Oh. <laughs> um, and I, I don't, has anybody seen Divergent? <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was, <laughs> <laughs> I watched that movie, Shailene Woodley is the star of that movie, but for me, the star of that movie is Zoe Kravitz. Mm -hmm. I watched that movie thinking, Zoe Kravitz plays the best friend. Zoe Kravitz, of course, being the daughter of Lenny Kravitz and Lisa Bonet. She's beautiful, they've given her a nice haircut. <laughs> um, she has something that is real in front of the camera. She can read her lines, she has a personality. She's got like a spunkiness. Every time something happened to her where like she got beat up or like thrown across the room, I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> that, it's kind of miscasting in a lot of ways because I just wouldn't believe that that character as played by Zoe Kravitz would put up with that. But you understand, I'm supposed to understand that as a sophisticated moviegoer in 2014, the, the apparatus can't support this, you know, I guess, Half black, half white, but a fourth of both. All three, all both those things. <laughs> anyway, this this woman of 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 different races mm -hmm. supporting what they hope will be a billion dollar franchise at some point. Mm -hmm. And I just, I mean, I would have thought, uh, as a casting director, I'm looking at these two women in this movie, and I'm saying, you guys are switching parts. Mm -hmm. You're just going to switch parts. Nobody knows who Shailene Woodley is. It doesn't cost mm -hmm. them anything to switch, <laughs> except. <laughs> The, the ability to sort of take this movie to like Indonesia and Japan <laughs> and Russia and say, look, what you're already familiar with, no challenges. And I think that is gonna, the point at which you get somebody to play the Jennifer Lawrence part in mm -hmm. something like a Hunger Games movie mm -hmm. is the point at which the floodgates will open on writers of color, mm -hmm. black actors starring mm -hmm. in these movies. I mean, that just, the f the, and this is why I, I hold to my enthusiasm for those Fast and the Furious movies. 
because is you can argue about their ultimate qualities, but I mean, I think their ultimate quality is good. But aside from that, the thing that they do for people who go to the movies who aren't white males, but include white males, who, so who aren't only white males, is say to everybody else, and I mean almost literally everybody else, hey, you can be part of one of these big mega blockbuster mm -hmm. franchises. Yes, you're stealing cars, but ultimately by the sixth movie, you're kind of saving the world. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way in which the racial politics of those movies changed over the course of their run, mm -hmm. which they began as an enterprise, as a vehicle for Paul Walker, basically, mm -hmm. this right. you know, blonde, yeah. blue-eyed surfer yeah. guy yeah. who goes into this black, this, this world of like, Latinos mm -hmm. and black people right. and Polynesians and oh my mm -hmm. god, yeah. and I'm a cop. Yeah. <laughs> by the end, by the sixth movie, he's basically one of them, and the stars of the movie are these two giant interracial guys. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like that is yeah. amazing to me, yeah. but it hasn't sacrificed any of its credibility along the way. If anything, it's become more credible, even as they demolish third world countries and. <laughs> you know, do things that are defy the laws of physics. I think the racial politics of those films is so interesting to me mm -hmm. because there's one white guy now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And everybody else is of color and most of those people of color are of mixed race and they are they are they were originally like social problems, but now they're saving the world. Mm -hmm. That is ridiculous but also totally awesome at the same time. <laughs> we have a question. Hi, uh, my name is Mia Evans. I'm not a student here. I'm a Cambridge resident. I'm a member of the NAACP Boston branch. Hi. Currently trying to build a relationship with the Harvard Black Men's Forum, so that's one of the reasons I'm here today, in addition to this being a lovely event. Um, so one organization whose work I like a lot right now is the African American Film Festival, film, film festival releasing movement. So I just wanted to get your quick thoughts on Ava DuVernay and the type of work she's doing and her organization. Just wanted to know what you thought about that. She is, do you know her? I'm not familiar, You no. should, you should, Ava DuVernay is, is, is a wonderful human being. Both, I mean, as a, I know her. I'm not friends with her or anything, but I know her. She's an independent <laughs> film producer um, who works really, really hard and, and at some point, I, I, like, I have the luxury of thinking that she does it out of principle, but no, I mean, the economics of the situation have sort of forced her into becoming the sort of person who has to work very hard to get funding for movies of color um, and to get them distributed, to get them financed in production and then distributed um, and then seen. Um, she is, as important to, to movies, I think, she, I mean, she's almost as important to movies as Tyler Perry is, mm. except the audiences for her movies are minuscule, and the movies that she tries to, to, yeah. to bring into theaters. Um, she, her, her, her last movie was called Middle of Nowhere. It was about a woman um, and her, caught between her ex-con boyfriend and a, and a man she meets you know, just a regular civilian man she meets. It's, it's, a, it's a really good movie. Um, I think that independent filmmaking is different now than it was, you know, 25 years ago when you had a real network and you had a more captive audience in some ways. Um, I think that her battle is a lot harder in 2014 than it would have been in 1991. Um, that doesn't change her, how she goes about, I mean, it might change the mechanics of how she goes about raising money for movies, but it has not changed her commitment to getting them made. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, your, your question was just, do we, do we know her, right? I mean, A plus. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. Like, how many, there are, there are only a handful of, everybody wants to go to Hollywood. She is somebody at this point who could totally go to Hollywood and like do a Netflix show. You know, she could be directing like a House of Cards episode per season, or she could be doing like sh um, uh, she she might have done a scandal. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm she might have done one because she's not stupid. <laughs> but I mean, she also <laughs> is working for Shonda Rhimes, who is another important black woman who is sneaking 
race and multiculturalism into your bad entertainment product. <laughs> and I think that, no, I mean, it's important it's that this real. show sucks. Yeah. Like, it's really watchable, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be good. Why can't she suck as much as white people yeah, suck? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love Scandal for almost that backhanded reason, but also because it's addictive. But I think that, I mean, I think Ava is somebody who could go that route, but she really thinks that there are a lot of people who have no money but have a vision and have a voice and just need somebody like her to find them. Mm -hmm. And she's all about like, I mean, she's really like a talent scout, really. Mm. Or like a, a field of, of, of mm. um, geez, I forgot. All right, whatever. <laughs> she's out there looking for people who want to tell stories and she is committed to helping them tell them. She has her own stories to tell, but she also really wants to help other people do that. You so, need people like that. Yeah, I mean, and there that aren't, I mean, sense. everybody at this point, I mean, it's easy to just do it for yourself, either, you know, extremely independently, or you go to Hollywood yeah. and become John Singleton. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to, uh, so we've got one more question. I do want to ask you, super short, like 30 oh, seconds. Oh, sorry. This is uh, what happened. No, no, no. <laughs> about, about another independent film that oh, you've been oh, oh. championing <laughs> recently, which is Blue Caprice. Oh yeah. Um, if you could just say a little bit about it and your and your your thoughts, to, I, I don't think most people in the audience will know. Uh, Blue Caprice is a movie uh, made by a French Canadian guy about the DC snipers. Um, it is it is not an exemplary depiction of black malehood, no. but it is really well made. And I think that what is interesting about it to me is it focuses it depathologizes and demonsterizes, if you'll accept that term, um, what we either thought we understood or, or understood or, or, or actually do understand about those two guys and turns that relationship into a very interesting, abusive father-son relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, does, it has nothing, no light to shed at all on black maleness and you know, yay, thank God. Because those guys did that. It actually happened. And there's no reason that the movies can't tell their story. And what actually is interesting about the way that it does it is it, it tells the sniper case from the sniper's point of view. And I, mm. I think that that is a disturbing way to tell a story. But I think politically it is actually quite radical at the same time. Mm. It's a really frightening film. Wow. Mm. So last question. My name is Anlay Herring, and I work at the Center for Effective Philanthropy, which is a nonprofit here in Cambridge. And my question is, because this conversation has largely focused on blacks in film, could you comment on themes you see emerging with respect to non-white, other non-white races in mm. film? Mm. Mm. You know, that's a really good uh, question. Um, so, at the beginning of every class that I have, I play a, a game with my students called Name Five, where um, <laughs> I have them write down on a sheet of paper, and I did this in the Hollywood and History film course, and I said, write down, in 30 seconds, write down five African-American actors, dead or alive, doesn't matter. And in 30 seconds, pretty much everybody can do that. And then I said, okay, in another 30 seconds, write down five Latino actors, write down five Asian actors, five Native American actors, five disabled actors. Um, and then it was like crickets. <laughs> like, mm. I mean, the struggle becomes more uh, difficult as the lists go on. And then, and even in deconstructing their list, okay, on your list, how many of them are women actors? How many of them, you know, um, and why is it so difficult to, to play this game? I think representation is kind of like the final frontier in film in terms mm -hmm. of not, not just having, um, African American presence and voices, um, because that's something that you know we see as a huge struggle. But Native American actors, I mean, when you see the Lone Ranger and Do Johnny Depp is playing um, Tonto or Squanto or Tonto, Tonto, Squanto, <laughs> um, <laughs> or, yes, 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 or you know, the, all of the uh, what is it, the vampire movies with um, oh, Taylor Lautner or Twilight. Um, yeah. How? And it's like, there are Native American actors, right? But how often do you actually see Native Americans playing themselves, right? Or playing Native American 
characters. Yeah, let's start there, and then what are really? they doing once they actually get the parts? Exactly, right? it's, it's, exactly. How how difficult that is. I remember um, showing a clip in class of Marlon Brando when he uh, wins the Oscar for The Godfather and refuses to accept the Oscar and has a Native American woman come up and give his acceptance speech mm -hmm. and basically talks about representation. And she gets booed, I mean, at the Oscars. Yeah. She says, we need to have basically more Native Americans representing Native Americans in film. And Sassy I mean- Sassy Little Feather. Yes, I mean, Brando together. is, Brando is Brando, that's what makes him great. But um, it's a huge issue, it's a huge issue. And so um, while it's kind of popular and hot topics to talk about like slavery and all of these, uh, new renaissance of black films, it's just as important, not equally important to talk about what this means for Latino actors and actresses, for Native American actors and actresses, for Asian American actors and actresses, because everyone's trying to be more than the stereotype, right? Everyone's trying to be seen as uniquely human in their own way, not burdened by this sort of expectation of what the audience thinks they should be. Um, that's an intense struggle. Um, and one that needs to be talked about more, quite frankly. I will say, though, I got very excited when I saw Cesar Chavez mm -hmm. last yeah. week. Not because it's great. I mean, it's, it's fine. But I really felt like, I mean, it also didn't do that well over the weekend. But I had a, I felt, I felt, ex I felt like this is the beginning of something between mm -hmm. Cuaron winning that director Oscar. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is a movie directed by Diego Luna, the actor. Um, starring, you know, all Chicano cast or mostly Chicano cast. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like that was the, th that movie felt like it could be the start of something important where mm -hmm. you can move, you can, you can stay within sort of the American system and not sort of farm out your, your, your movies and your television shows to, you know, um, Telemundo and, mm -hmm. and, um, Univision. Univision, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually stay within the, the sort of system that everybody, the sort of English language system, and not be afraid to have a Spanish language product um, directed by, written by, produced by, and or starring Spanish-speaking people. Um, I don't know, it just felt like it, this could be the, that to me seemed like this is how you do it. You mm -hmm. don't spend a lot of money. You, I mean, it's independently financed and Hollywood had nothing to do with it, Cesar Chavez. But that's how it always starts. I mean, right. I mean and, and it, it, you know, it, it, you always sort of get these, these bumps, right? Where Justin Lin, before he became the Fast and Furious guy, was this really promising Asian American filmmaker who seemed like he was gonna spark this renaissance of young Asian guys making movies about what it's like to be Asian, but he skipped right past that and just wanted to, he did other stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wound up doing something, I think, slightly, not more valuable, but as valuable with these, with these you know, Fast and Furious movies. Because nobody's saying, oh, well, we can't trust this young Asian guy to direct these movies. He just, he made one good one when nobody was looking, and they're like, oh, well, this is a no-brainer. He's actually better at these than, than John Singleton, who <laughs> I mean, didn't really care that much when he made his. Um, so I don't know. I mean, what, is, what we're talking about in, in every example of the things we've been talking about tonight is representation mm -hmm. and who yeah. actually gets to say yes. Yeah. And if you're going to work within the system, you need somebody at the top. And nine times out of 10, it's a white guy between the ages of 45 and 65. You need somebody to be like, you need one of those guys to be like, my granddaughter or my grandson is a fan of X, Y, Z, and wouldn't care that the star of that movie was Michael B. Jordan, mm -hmm. or wouldn't care that the star of that movie was Michael Pena. Mm -hmm. um, and to just have, I mean, it's all about courage. I mean, and sometimes when you are spending $100, billion, $100 million on a movie, or <laughs> $150 million, you want to make it back, and if you don't think Michael Pena is the person who's going to get you your money back, you probably aren't going to do it. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like there's a, you have the opportunity to screw up a little bit in Hollywood. I'd like to see them screw up more with people of color. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think After Earth was a really good example of. I mean, it's Will Smith, but <laughs> I mean, 
the fact that that movie was A, terrible, <laughs> Awful. And, and B, a bomb, was interesting to me, but I feel like it was directed by M. Night Shyamalan and starring those two, Crazy Jaden <laughs> and Will. I felt like I'm I'm glad somebody took the risk in 2013, yeah. and I, I you know I wish that it had worked out for everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean I think that you'll I think there'll be more things. I'm hoping there'll be more things like that where they'll give Quaron a Sandra Bullock and George Clooney movie and mm -hmm. a, and understand that he is a great filmmaker. Yeah. And will oh, yeah. give you back something that is worth your hundred million dollars. Well, I want everybody to thank our panelists, Wesley Morris, Kelly Jackson. Thank the uh, Institute of Politics and the Harvard Black Men's Forum for putting the event together. And it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation. I'm glad you guys could all come out. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Brandon. <laughs> thank you.